Hello, everybody. Oh, y'all still warmed up. I thought it was going to be super thin, but I'm loving how many of you people are still around. Um, can we say a shout out? Say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we made it. Uh, so real quick, a quick question. I don't know if y'all have had the luxury of having like a vegetable from like a garden, right? Something homegrown. For some reason, a tomato or a cucumber from your own garden just tastes better than like Publix, right? So what's happening today, we actually have our homegrown talent. And I'm gonna make my intro super short just so we can get our homegrown talent out here. I wanna start with Dr. Zerny Reed. Give me one second. She made sure she gave me the right intro. Dr. Zerny Reed is a science writer and a faculty member in the UF Department of Psychology, Psychiatry and an affiliate faculty member in the UF Department of Journalism, where she teaches science writing. Her work has most recently appeared in the National Geographic. She earned a PhD in chemistry from Emory University and a graduate certificate in science communication from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her bachelor's degree in chemistry is from the University of West Indies, Mona, in her native Jamaica. She will be interviewing today our very own Dr. Tom Frazier. I don't know if y'all know this, but he is the very first chief science officer in the state of Florida. Dr. Frazier has begun his journey at UF, actually. Dr. Frazier has been the director of the University of Florida School of Natural Resources and Environment since 2013, and was interim director for a year before that. Except for graduate research at the University of California at Santa Barbara from 1995, starting in 1990, Dr. Frazier has been at the University of Florida since 1987 when he joined the Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences Department as a biological scientist. He worked his way up through assistant and associate professorships in the department until becoming the associate chairman in 2008. It is my great pleasure to bring our homegrown talent back. Thanks. All right. Thanks for sticking around, everybody. Um, so, Tom, what the heck is a chief science officer for a state? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's a complicated job, actually. So, I think as most people probably know, um, it's the first position, and so there's not really a, a model for it. But um, it was created in large part to help address many of the environmental concerns that we face in, in Florida. So uh, a focus of my job right now is to deal with many of the water quality issues that are affecting uh, in a negative way uh, much of the state, especially South Florida. So, um, But the, the job's certainly bigger than just water quality. We have all kinds of issues out there and they relate to things like coral reefs, minimum flows and levels in our various waters. Um, so all kinds of things. All right. Um, and so this symposium, this session is about um, public trust in research. Um, to what extent is um, communicating with the public about science um, part of your job? And um, in what forms does that take? So what kinds of audiences are you talking to? Um, are there different approaches that you take to the conversations with different groups? Yeah, so I mean, uh, communicating science is obviously a, a priority for me, I think is a priority for the administration. So I talk, or take an opportunity to talk to as many groups as I possibly can, and, and those, they're wide ranging. There may be environmental groups, they may be um, uh, rotary clubs, other business groups. Um, I spend a lot of time working and talking with decision makers, lobbyists, um, a whole suite of groups that are, are people. Um, and. But it's really important as well, and again, it's a priority of the agency that I'm primarily aligned with and the administration to communicate science to the public, right? And so for the last several months, I've been working with our team to uh, try to develop or, and implement essentially a public-facing 
a web portal that tells people what the water quality is like, for example, in Florida. So they, they know where it's good and they know where it's bad. We're not trying to hide that from anybody, but also uh, letting them know what we're doing to, to take care or address the issues um, if there are problems. Right. And um, so on that uh, topic of providing information to the public, we do know that misinformation about science is it's a pervasive problem. Many folks um, here at UF and around the country and around the world really are figuring out um, the essence of the problem and then ways to address it uh, using educational efforts or um, technological means, you know, some digital solutions. Have you encountered um, misinformation in your work and how have you been able to address it? Um, and, you know, one thing we know is that um, sometimes people's political ideologies and social factors will um, relate to how they, they accept or, or don't accept science. So have you had to deal with misinformation? And, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I mean, so um, I think most of or many of the issues that I deal with on a regular basis are fairly contentious issues, and people have opinions, you know, on, on one side or the other. Um, and so, what I try to do is, when somebody wants to talk about a particular issue or or uh, voices a, a particular viewpoint, um, and I think that it's not. Uh, defendable, at least on a scientific basis. Um, I spend a fair amount of time trying to uh, talk with them, not at them necessarily, but to say, hey, here's the nature of the problem. Uh, these are the types of data that bear on that problem. And this is how I interpret those data. And it might, in fact, change your perspective a little bit uh, or not. So I really do spend a lot of time trying to communicate the, the issue or dive into the issue a little bit and so people have a much uh, deeper understanding of, of some of the facts or some of the data that bear on that issue. So when you make scientific recommendations and they might clash with political goals or, or strategies, um, is there a way that you, you frame messages for optimal um, possibility of acceptance by the people you're um, making the recommendations to? Yeah, again, so, I mean, most things that I'm, I'm dealing with aren't black and white, right? And so what I try to do is, again, gather information, like we always do in science, right? We gather information, we synthesize that information, um, and we try to interpret it, and then uh, explain to people what that interpretation means, or at least what my interpretation means. and. It, I, I try to walk a very narrow path in that regard, so I want to provide information that's going to help inform decisions, um, not necessarily make a hard recommendation. But again, if somebody was to ask me, you know, if, uh, if I would provide a particular recommendation, I would, I would probably do that, um, but I would do it in a, um, in a way that says, this is what I think, this is what the weight of the evidence you know, says to me, but there are caveats and, and there are other issues that you need to be aware of or I might want to be aware of uh, that might affect this decision down the road. All right, um, you talked a bit about the task force on um, blue, to address uh, blue-green algae and so on. Could you give us some details about that work? Yeah, sure, so one of the things I think, again, if people have been reading the news, we have a, a governor and an administration that are um, pretty focused on making um, improvements in our environment. And one of the things that happened right out of the gate with this particular governor is he uh, issued an executive order and as part of that executive order he created my position um, and he also created an Office of Environmental Accountability and Transparency which I oversee and he created a Blue Green Algae Task Force and the reason that he did that was to um, bring some science to bear on that issue. Uh, it's a huge issue, particularly in South Florida, Lake Okeechobee and the estuaries that are on either side of our state. And because of the problems, the intensity of those blooms, the duration of those blooms, that it had a huge uh, economic impact. And so he appointed essentially a, a, a task force that's comprised of academics, you know, uh, from around the state, internationally and nationally recognized uh, scientists. One is from the University of Florida, Wendy Graham, uh, who's the director of the Water Institute. Others are uh, Jim Sullivan, who's the director of Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution. Valerie Paul, who's the director of the Smithsonian Field Station. 
um, Mike Parsons, who's at Gulf Coast University, and, and a woman named Evelyn Geyser, who's at FIU. They all have different strengths, right? Um, some are hydrologists, some are uh, chemical ecologists, some are just ecologists. But having that group come together to um, start to deal with some of the big issues that are related to, to blue green algae blooms has, has been really important. Um, I mean, I push them and I have the opportunity, I guess, or the, the privilege of facilitating their uh, discussion and, and their liberations. But uh, we pushed them pretty hard and over the summer because we knew that we had an early legislative session, right? And in order to get some recommendations about what to do about blue-green algae blooms, uh, we needed to, to get that out in the fall so we could deal with things uh, in the legislative sp session in the spring. And, uh, you know, again, I'm pretty happy about where we ended up, right? So we had a good scientific dialogue. Um, that dialogue re uh, resulted in a number of recommendations with regard to uh, potential changes that we could make legislatively that might help improve our environment. The governor took those, uh, many of those recommendations and um, in, proposed some water quality legislation. That legislation was subsequently adopted, you know, modified slightly uh, uh, by one of our senators, and it's also found its way into uh, one of the House committees as well. So I'm hopeful that those recommendations will ultimately uh, find their way into some legislation this year, and things will be better. <laughs> Are there opportunities, so there are lots of faculty in the room and, and graduate students and others, um, are there opportunities for collaboration um, with researchers and um, educators here at UF um, with your office? And um, what are areas uh, of focus that you would um, want to see coming out of UF um, that align with your, your work? Sure. Yeah, I mean, so I would back up a little bit and say, you know, part of the reason that I was interested in, in, in taking this position, right, is that I was hoping to forge a better relationship between um, the academy and uh, our decision makers, right? And so I think, I mean, particularly at the University of Florida, it, I mean, there's tremendous intellectual capacity here, you know, and we do things better than most places, obviously. That's where we're a preeminent institution. Um, but you know, we we discover, we innovate, you know, um, and we don't do that necessarily uh, to the same degree in, in, in the agencies here. Um, so I think there's a tremendous opportunity to look at some of the problems and the issues that we're dealing with, um, make those types of issues or um, a priority, perhaps, uh, for for the universities. But again, there's there's a ton of opportunities. I think, particularly in innovative technologies, um, it would be an obvious one for me. You know. Right. Um, why do you think it's important to have someone in this chief science officer role here in Florida? What is it about this state that makes this a particular need? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's important. Um, for, for several reasons, I think that for whatever reason, you know, and, and I missed the most the bulk of the conference or, or the workshop here today, so I, I'm not sure exactly what was said, but uh, I think many people, particularly in the, in this room, would agree that there's been a general um, a perception that, that government isn't really. Um, including science, right? It hasn't really been inserted into the, the decision-making arena. And so one of my goals is to make sure that science is inserted into the, um, the policy arena, and, but also make it visible, right? And so that's why I do talk to a number of people so that people have confidence in the fact that um, when we're making decisions that we're at least considering science. And so, so what's in a name? So a lot of the issues that you'll be addressing um, are related to climate change, um, mm -hmm. uh, but you're, the, you're not the chief, you know, the chief climate officer, you're the right. chief science officer. Um, is there anything to the name? Um, yeah, I mean, so again, there was a couple of things that happened about the same time as when my appointment came about, right? So um, we also have a, a newly appointed chief resiliency officer in the state. And um, she works on many climate-related issues. I mean, uh, clearly, Florida's ground zero for sea level rise. That's a, you know, a consequence of climate change. Um, but we 
she tends to think about adaptation and, and mitigation strategies, you know, a, more of a resilience framework. So we're talking about infrastructure, you know, how do we build new roads, how do we, how do we adapt our um, uh, wastewater treatment systems, things of that nature. But I talk to her on a regular basis, and I mean, science goes hand in hand with, with her activities, right? Science needs to inform um, some of those decisions that are, are made. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good relationship. Um, so you had a long and distinguished career as a scientist. You're still a faculty member here. Um, how have those um, skills translated to the new position, and what new things did you have to learn um, for this new job? You probably had to learn some new um, diplomatic skills, I'm sure. Yeah. Wow, that's a big <laughs> question, right? So it was a long career. I'm not sure it was a distinguished one. So, um, but, um, I mean, my background is is pretty broad, you know, and so I've had an opportunity uh, throughout my career to work in a broad, you know, suite of systems. I've worked in polar systems, tropical systems, I've worked in freshwater systems, uh, um, coastal marine systems, so I've worked in our springs, I've worked in our coral reefs, and so I think that breadth uh, was appealing actually to the, the people that I'm working with now, and so that's that served me well. Um, one of the things I wasn't really good at is speaking legalese. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I do work with uh, a ton of people, um, lawyers, and so learning a new language for me has, has been, been challenging. But I, you know, I think, I'm taking the liberty with your questions, right? I'm just expanding on them, but um, sure. I think it, it made me think about how I might um, talk about science to students moving forward a lot, right? I mean, so things are changing so fast right now. I mean, I talked about innovation, technological advances. There's a lot of new tools and they change all the time. Um, but one of the things that I need to be able to do is to, to address a number of different issues on a regular basis, right? And so one day I may be talking about coral reefs, one day I'll be talking about, you know, water wars in uh, Florida and Georgia, or I'll be talking about, you know, nitrate pollution in our springs. Um, so it's, it's, it's all over the place, and nobody can be an expert in all of those things, right? And I remember hearing the word expert, right? Um, uh, but um, I, so I think it's, it's super important to me that students that are trained in science are rigorously trained in the, in the process and they understand how to do science, um, how to evaluate science, and how to interpret the, the data that they're seeing. Because I think if you can do that, um, then you can move across different kind of um, issues pretty seamlessly, right? It's not, you don't necessarily have to have the expertise in everything. And I think if you are a, a good practitioner of science, and then I think you can definitely uh, earn some credibility. And I always like to say that a PhD is really a, a PhD in problem solving, right? You can yeah. take the skills and transfer it to anywhere else. Sure. Um, do you see any opportunities for students? You mentioned um, students a lot um, with your office, internships, or anything like that, um, that could be a, a benefit to students? Sure, I mean, and there's, uh, I would always try to make some opportunities for, for students to, to get engaged um, in, in my office. And I mean, I know that we have internship um, opportunities, for example, and I've talked to some folks in the Graham Center before, but I would extend um, beyond that as well. I mean, it, I think that if you can get students an opportunity to move outside of the lab or, or their particular lab group um, and um, perhaps gain some experience in um, kind of the regulatory world or the, or the political world, I think um, it gives them a, a better perspective on how things actually work. And so I think as they're trying to make their own contributions, I think that will help them. So I'm, I'm certainly a big fan of providing a broad suite of opportunities for students. All right. Um, and so back to you and the job. Um, given you hadn't really had this sort of um, appointment before um, and you'd worked in academia uh, for all this time, did you have any reservations about taking this position? If so, what were they? And yeah. have you, do you still have them? Have you overcome them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you going to stay in the job? No, I mean, it's, uh, academia is a nice place, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's... It's, I mean, once you kind of go through the, 
the tenure and promotion process, and um, there's a lot of security there. And so I think if you're thinking about what you might do, if you might move out of the kind of the academic sphere, um, I think you lose some of that comfortableness, I guess, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. Um, it it's, can be a very um, volatile world. And so um, it's, again, it's, it's, I think it's, it's challenging for somebody who's worked in an academic world to all of a sudden find themselves in a regulatory or a political arena. Um, but the reason that I actually wanted to do that was because I felt like my voice wasn't being heard within uh, the academy here, right? And it's, it's not that it wasn't being heard internally. I, I, I was looking for ways to take the science that I was involved with and make it um, insert it again into our, you know, management world. And I was having a hard time doing that. And so that was one part of it, right? And then the other part was, you know, I started to serve as an editor or chief editor of, of journals. And it, it's almost like this, people would always, they would write a paper and at the end of the paper they'd have a one or two sentences and they would say, hey, you know, and by the way, all of this work has management applications, you know, mm -hmm. and I would say like, what? <laughs> right? You know, really? Or, or did you just feel like you have to do this to make, establish some type of relevance or something? Um, and so, again, I just don't think that we were going the next step of actually taking that science, right? We might have been trying to convince ourselves as a community that we were relevant, but we needed to do something different to, to make it actually relevant. Yeah. Do you see this um, position being extended beyond this administration? Do you see as a permanent thing going forward, regardless of um, which party is in power? Or? Well, I would hope so, right, again, so the, I, I mean, one of my goals is to make science relevant, right, and, and, and in a way that people start to have more confidence um, in our government, right, regardless of it's a Republican administration or a Democratic administration. Um, I think that what you want to do is have confidence that the process is working, right? And, and the information that's helping feed decisions um, is, it, it's open, it's transparent. Uh, so I, again, I, I think that for me, I, I hope that it lives on. Um, and I actually hope that um, other states might a, adopt a similar model, yeah. Have you been contacted by folks sure. in other states? Yeah, oh yeah, uh, there's certainly other people. So can you, you know, call their names? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> but, right. Yeah, but I mean, people are interested in it, right? I mm -hmm. mean, it's um, it's a big issue. I mean, it's not, Florida isn't the only state that's, that's subject to all kinds of, of challenges, right? Um, every state is, right? Mm -hmm. And trying, again, to, to think about how they put a public face on how um, their administrations or their agencies might be dealing with these problems is very important, trying to establish some trust and, and credibility, yeah. And so you started the job on April Fool's Day yeah, last no year. No joke. <laughs> um, what are your your goals for this? How do you define? How would you define success? So at the end of your tenure, um, what measures do you look back at and say um, we we were successful because we did this and that? And that? Yeah. Um, again, so there's goals at all kind of levels, right? And it, uh, it's really, really important for me that, um, I mean, I, success for me would be if people had confidence in our government, right? And in our agencies that are kind of carrying out um, the, the mission, I guess. Um, and so if I can help instill some of that confidence, that to me would be success, right? Um, if, um, if I could, influence decision makers in such a way that we're making positive gains so that um, uh, not just short-term but long-term gains so all 22 million Floridians are going to be in a better position I, I think that would be great um, as I said before you know it was rewarding for me to work with a, a group of academics to make recommendations that were ultimately kind of adopted in a proposal by our governor um, and then subsequently adopted by um, our our lawmakers, right? At least, and and if we can find 
if, if I can see that type of input manifesting itself in, you know, in rules and regulations, uh, that, I think that's success. I really do. Yeah. yeah. That sounds good. Um, so we do have some more time, so I'm going to take the liberty of um, inviting anyone who has a question, but please make it a question, <laughs> not, uh, don't hold forth. Uh, and there are microphones. Please. Uh, you spoke about um, your voice being heard. Do you feel um, you are able to reach out to what I call um, non-academic um, organizations or facilities that you are able to speak at, say, like an Essence Festival or something like that where you can talk about science to um, a broader group of people? Yeah, so, um, excuse me, um, I I'm, have um, and I'm willing to talk to a, a broad variety of groups. There's no real um, leash uh, on what I do, which is refreshing, right? I think a lot of people might expect that there is, um, but I, again, I talk to, to civic groups. Um, I talk to, uh, you know, lobbyists. I talk to politicians, right? And um, it's, it's really important to me to talk to as many groups as I possibly can, as many different types of people to, again, not just like, try to shove data down people's throat, but to try to explain what that data mean, or what those data mean, excuse me, um, and, and how we might interpret those data and how that might influence their way of thinking somehow, yeah. Tom, thank you for coming. Um, do you have a way or have you thought through on your team about uh, like a horizon scan to identify those issues that you know might be controversial to get in front of those with a proactive science message um, to help guide the discussion? Yeah, um, and so you're exactly right. I mean, that would be the goal, right? So right now we're in very much in reactive mode, but I think um, I, I, I project out all the time, right? And there, there are big issues that we need to be thinking about and how do we get there? Um, and some of them are quite controversial, and I think everybody in the room knows what those are. Um, but in order to get there, again, I think you have to build relationships. It, it's, you know, it, before I got to the position, um, I don't think that there was a lot of, um, I guess, discourse between state agencies. Um, I mean, it's a priority for me to talk not only like, for example, to the Department of Health, uh, the FWC, um, uh, the Department of Ag, all of those groups, right? And to think about, okay, what are the problems that we're going to face five years from now, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? And can we align our efforts moving forward um, to think about how we're going to tackle them so we're in a much better position? And so, yeah, we, we think about those things all the time. Yeah. So, hey, Tom, how are you doing? Great, Nick. Thank how you. are you? Thank you for your service as our first chief scientist. Uh, thanks, thanks for, for letting me go. <laughs> yes, thanks for, yeah, that's right. Thanks for stepping up to the plate. So I guess I got a two-part question, Tom. So now that we have a chief scientist, what do you see as opportunities for us in the academy, particularly UF, to kind of step up to the plate, perhaps work with you on advancing science? And secondly, what can we do in the academy to support you as our chief scientist? Yeah, okay, so, I mean, it, it's, as I've said before, it's a priority for me not only to talk to the different agencies and get the agencies talking to one another, um, but also to engage the academy, right, and, and, and develop or implement a, a mechanism that allows the academy to have more access, right, to decision makers or people that might actually um, be interested in the in the products or the skills or, or whatever you might want to call them that the academy has to offer. I think that's essential. I mean, again, we have a tremendous amount of intellectual capacity in the university. We have a tremendous amount of intellectual capacity, you know, in the private sector as well. Um, but I do think that we would be remiss if we weren't um, engaging on a regular basis because I think one of the things, again, that um, people, particularly in the science world, do well at the university. They're very creative, right? You, you um, and innovation is key. You don't, in the agencies, you, you don't, you're not set up to do that. You're set up to kind of enforce laws, you know, or, or manage systems. Um, 
But when you, when you are in that world, you're reacting all the time. There's not an opportunity for innovation, right? But I think by working with, with scientists and others, and you say, hey, these are the problems, I'll get to the question before, you know, of you know, what are we doing proactively? What are we looking forward? Uh, I think it's particularly important to engage um, the academy in those types of things so they know what types of things they could be working on so that um, they can provide new insights and new tools, right, so we can do things better. So um, I don't know if I answered both of those questions at the same time or not, but um, I mean, if I can help, for example, to uh, facilitate a dialogue um, with folks in the universities with the appropriate people, um, I'm always happy to do that. I think it's a super, super important to communicate and, and have that exchange of information. So, I mean, hopefully I'm a resource in that regard. Hello, um, I have a question just sort of about the fact that you were Florida's chief science officer, not just the University of Florida's chief yeah. science officer. So I guess I wanted to ask about um, potential collaborations with um, other academies in the uh -huh. state. So um, all of our friends at UCF, USF, FSU, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you know, what you envision for that and what, what, how you can leverage perhaps additional collaborations between um, different academy stakeholders, different community stakeholders as sort of someone who represents the entire state. Yeah, and, and that's a good question, right? I mean, obviously I have a big place in my heart for the University of Florida, but um, there's talent all over the state. We've got a great state university system, right? And so there's expertise at the University of Central Florida that may not exist at the University of Florida. Um, one of the things that I would like to do is at least because of the things that I've done in the past and the people that I know, right, is to be able to identify where those strengths exist, right, and uh, tap that capacity wherever it might be um, to, to help uh, the state um, deal with some of the issues that they have to deal with. So again, I'm very, very inclusive. Uh, so it's, it's not all about the University of Florida. <laughs> um, Dr. Frazier, I'm wondering when you talk about goals, is there a, um, could you give us an idea of an agenda perhaps? I'm, I understand why you had to deal with the task force, task force on algal blooms right away. Mm -hmm. But in say, in terms of the legislative session or even Pass beyond that, are there like priorities that you see? Yeah, I mean, so again, so um, if, I, if I back up, you know, you realize a, a huge focus was on water quality and, and algal blooms in particular. Um, I think moving forward, uh, I, we were very focused on identifying um, s causes of that problem and, and we identified nutrient pollution as, as one of the major things and there are all kinds of sources there, right, and things like septic systems that involve collaborations with the Department of Health, you know, agricultural issues, um, and we have water infrastructure problems, all of those types of things. And so uh, I think we just touched the tip of the iceberg with that first set of recommendations that we made, but we have other issues that are on the horizon. I, I know for, uh, for a fact that we will deal with the issue of um, algal toxins moving forward and what uh, acute and chronic exposure issues are out there um, because I think that's a, um, something that's a priority. Moving uh, beyond that, I can see, for example, we're gonna deal with um, reclaimed water and, and water reuse types of things. Uh, again, we've got, depending on the numbers that you wanna look at, we have 500 to 1,000 people moving to Florida every day. And it looks like we have a lot of water, right? But uh, we're, we're gonna be challenged to provide water for all of those people. And so thinking about how we take that reclaimed water, um, we turn it into potable water, for example, um, will be a big issue moving forward. It's not just about water quality, it's about water supply, so that would be another type of thing that we're moving forward on. Um, I mean, it's, it feels pretty good to be able to sit up here and talk about climate change. <laughs> you know, there's no repercussions really for doing that. Um, we, as I said before, Florida is ground zero for sea level rise. But we, because of that, we have lots of things that we have to deal with. We have to deal with water infrastructure problems. We have to deal with our transportation system, all of those types of things. So those are clearly part of our planning process as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Greetings, Dr. Dr. Fisher. I was curious if this position, I'm right, right here. There you go. I'm curious if your position would help to integrate with uh, science education um, during high school, middle school, 
an elementary school to see if we can start to kind of cultivate, you know, potentially millions of children in the state to appreciate science and have an appetite for it. So does your position um, influence the education, the, the science curriculum for children? Yeah, I, I mean, I would like it to. And so, for example, uh, earlier on I was talking about we're right now in the, in the process of creating a public-facing kind of website that all provides information on the state of our water resources, really, right? Um, but embedded in that is information on um, what science is, is taking place, for example, to um, inform some of the decisions or the act activities that are taking place. And I, I, in our discussions, anyways, we've been thinking about, okay, um, what is that? There's a broad audience out there, right? And we might refine that a little bit and have opportunities uh, for uh, K through 12 teachers or even beyond that to access appropriate materials that they could insert into curricula and things like that. And so I think that's important as well. Good question. All right. So thanks everybody for your questions and. Dr. Fraser, thanks so much for coming to talk with us about what you do as the states and the U.S.'s first chief science officer. There you go. At the state level. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. And again, thanks for all the support. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, y'all. So after our next five minutes, the people who stayed after, we got the best treat ever. All right, so listen. In the Harn right now, they're setting up, and y'all gonna get tokens for either beer, wine, refreshments. So all of us who stayed after, listen, we about to party, okay? <laughs> but before we do so, in the spirit of building our community of trust, Anne is in the house right now. She's going to pass the microphone. This is just us just tying a nice little bow around our time together. So we can get three volunteers to just give us like a take-home message. Uh, don't shout at once. Yes, wonderful. Uh, hi, my name is Cynthia Barnett. I'm also in the College of Journalism and Graham Center for Public Service. And if there's a take-home message for me. It's, it's one that I've often thought about and felt, and that is um, joy, right? The transmission of joy. Um, the importance of scientists translating the joy of science as much as they do the next um, wisdom thing. And I think that joy um, really comes from humani the humanities. Um, and this kind of highlights the importance of bringing the science together with the humanities. Um, over the history of the University of Florida, the scientists who have been really good at communicating, people like Archie Carr, people like Tom Frazier, really had that nice sense of joy about them. And that's what stays with me. So thank you. Yeah, it was something to say about body language and how we communicate, knowing that our physical, everything we bring into a space is as effective in terms of what's coming out of our mouth as well. That was powerful for me as well. Two more people. Two more. What was great this morning, yes, right there while Anna's walking. What was great this morning, we really started the day like in the space of vulnerability because we were like raising our hands saying stuff that we probably wouldn't have said in a global setting, let alone it being recorded. So in the spirit of that, here we go. Hi, um, my name is Charlie. I'm actually a student in the College of Public Health and Health Professionals. So thank you for allowing us to be here. Um, it's really interesting to see different departments coming together and really talking about public health, actually, because addressing the community, going to the community, learning what they need and learning how to talk to them on a one-to-one -one personal basis is a huge thing in public health that we need everybody's help in doing. It's not just us doing it, it's everybody. It's connecting with the um, Department of Journalism, Department of IFAS, everyone can work together to better improve the community and think forward. Yes, all right, one more. This is the best take-home message we can get. All right, Ann, you got a little bit of a walk right down here. <laughs> I 
thank you for being our, you know, final message for the day. You're welcome. So, uh, yeah, I'm Rosemary Laurie. I'm chair of the plant pathology department. Uh, yes. This. Yay, plant pathology. Um, and I'm a newbie in terms of science communication to the public. And I'm a f also a flaming introvert. So I have, I have some work to do, but I really feel like I'm hooked now. And uh, so I'm, I'm looking for other opportunities to move forward in, in the kind of uh, um, sort of venue that this provided. I, I want another venue. I want another place to go to continue to, to grow this uh, talent and this perspective. So. I can't imagine a better way to wrap up our day. Okay. Right, that we need more. All right, thank you so much, y'all. I'll see you in the horn. Y'all have a good day.